Is it the opposite where it's almost too much information and now people can't really distinguish good information from bad information? Or do you even have an opinion on it? Well, I always have an opinion on everything. That's my problem. <laughs> I always I always step on my own. Uh, you know what? What's up, everyone? I just want to let you know this Mark Baker tour talk was so insightful, so good, an hour and a half long that I had to break it into two parts. We go over his new video series. We talk about how YouTube is impacting education and learning and how it's impacted his video business, coaching in eight different languages based on skill set, how you get from one level to the next. No matter what skill level you are, he kind of talks about how to get to the next level. We spend a lot of time on two-handed, what it has done for bowling, the growth of bowling, if new youth players should go two-handed or not, uh, do they get injured more, can they last as long as thumb in bowlers? And we talk about what do you, what should you look for in a good coach? What are the signs of a good coach? Can you get improvement from only one lesson? And should you get a bowling ball or should you get a lesson? And many, many more topics. I felt like an hour and a half was just too long for one video. So we're going to have two close to about 45 minute sessions. This is part one. Part two will be next week, same time, Friday at 4 p.m. Arizona time. And I appreciate all your support. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let us know down in the comments. We're going to keep trying to find Great people with unique experiences and perspectives for our tour talks. Enjoy this conversation with Mark Baker. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another tour talks. The series has been doing well for us. Uh, we can't thank you guys enough for the support. We have another huge name, arguably the best coach, if not one of the best coaches in the world, here with us today to talk about just the differences between skill levels, how to improve your game, as well as a new video series he has out that I have watched and loved. It's great. Mr. Mark Baker is here with us today. Mark, thanks so much for the time, man. I, I can't thank you enough. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Look forward to the questions. Yeah. And for those that may have been living under a rock or are new to bowling and maybe don't know Mark, he right now is mainly known as a world-renowned coach, but he actually had a, a, a pretty extensive background as a professional bowler as well. He's made over 20 telecasts, which is almost just as impressive as a stat as impressive of a stat as his four national titles. Um, and he's worked with some of the best players in the world, Bill O'Neill, Mika, Chris. He's actually traveled the world with Chris in his Barker, Baker Barnes clinics. And uh, yeah, and, and and now also coaches the Adam Splitters, so the PBA, uh, the PBA League. And to me, the most impressive rep, to me, uh, the most impressive stat is the amount of reps that you have as a coach, over 10,000 lessons. Uh, that's, that's a little short. It's yeah, yeah. I'd say it's closer to 30. Yeah, I was going to say, I took that off the site. And I mean, that's still a lot. But Well, I've been, yeah, I've been knocking them out pretty hard for the last 15 years. So since I've been doing this full time, you know, I put together a business plan with my uncle and my father, two of the, the two smartest guys I know. And we put together a business plan that had nothing to do with bowling, more to do with business. And I gave myself numbers or goals that I didn't think anybody else had ever tried. And I accomplished them. And if I wanted to get good at it, I needed to see it a lot. I needed to get where I didn't get... Somebody shows up, take a lesson. I can't say, oh, wow, I've never seen anybody bowl like that before. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't lend to build a lot of confidence in the bowler and my skill set. So the only way I could get better was to do it a lot. I found a lot of different ways to do that. And so that's kind of how that's kind of how I, why I think some of my stuff does so well is I've just done it for a long time and a lot of people. Yeah, 100%. And I like to attend classes and learn a lot of things. And I'll be the first one to tell you that I can – a lot of them, you know, I, I think Einstein has a quote that like information is not the same as knowledge or something like that. Until you can really apply the information in real life, that's really when it becomes knowledge. And in coaching, you can know a lot of information, but reps are really underrated, in my opinion. Like even for me as a coach, I feel like I do not get enough reps. It takes me a long time to see things. And so anyways, that it's a pretty impressive stat. I want to get into your your video series. I loved it. It was great. Those of you that have not checked it out or seen it, it is well worth the money. I got both of them. One is on one handed, one is on two handed. So Mark, how is that video series doing so far relative to your expectations? It, it sounds like with the business plan you mentioned, you're kind of a, you probably had some goals going into it. How did- <laughs> My how goals did, were so, my goals were so out of, the, 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 that was, that was a bad, uh, yeah, I just thought it would, it's doing very well. And it can, you know, it's been a couple months since I've already sold seven videos today. So that's considered a pretty good day. It's more about this is going to be more of a long term thing because it's really, really hard to get the information out to enough people to know that it's even available. Yeah. I mean, it's very, yeah. very, it's a very tricky thing. You know, I have a pretty good rep on the West Coast. If you get east of the Mississippi, I bet you they don't know who I am. 
So, I mean, right, I, right. I'm pretty well known in Southern. I'm always amazed that somebody knows who I am. I'm, I'm very well known in Southern California, maybe Arizona, and I do some camps. I don't see myself that way. So, but it's hard. But the sales are going very well. I, I have to admit, I thought more, I thought it would be a bigger hit with the two-handed community. Because oh, interesting. I would have thought that too. Because of the the numbers are running, they're running really even. I mean, if I look at the if I look at the the analytics of it, I mean, uh, one hand it gets ahead, then two hand it makes a rush, and then I right. mean, they're pretty. It's almost fifty fifty as it goes. And uh, I would have thought because my when, as a coach coaching a ton of two handed people and doing two handed camps, the most common thing I was told was there's no good coaching for two handers. There's nothing out there on, you know, everything online is not really good. It's not really coaching. There's tons for one handers. I went, okay, there, there's a need. I'll address it. And then by however I pulled it off, I started with the two best who ever lived at it. So yeah. it's Belmonte, who's fundamentally perfect. Yeah. And Simo, who does something so unique that his record reflects it. So the ability to get both those guys in here and the two days we filmed, Maybe there was a competition between them. I didn't know about it, but they were on point. It was <laughs> it was fairly impressive. Watch those two were so on. It was like wow. Yeah. That was so. Anyways, I would thought the two handed community would hear about right. an instructional video and and blow it up. But I also learned something very valuable during this process that you cannot beat YouTube. YouTube is hard to beat. I was people, just about, people yeah. like free. I was just about to ask that. Yeah, I was. So I was really curious because I, I you know, I, there's a million things to mention in terms of your accolades in the intro. But one thing I didn't mention is you've also written a book around coaching and mm -hmm. produced and created a DVD, which I was a customer of both of those, which tells you how long I've been in bowling and been interested. There in you bowling. go. But I, that was going to be my question is since you've done all of those, since you've done the book, the DVD, now you have this online video. And I was thinking about how difficult it is to compete with YouTube. And the thing is, is this video, for those of you who have not seen it yet, it's, I have, I've consumed a lot of YouTube content as well. It's not the same type of content. The way I like to think about it is YouTube has got little blurps of information. You don't know the credibility of it, but it's not really put together and structured in a way that I would say is like a curriculum, you know, where it's really mm -hmm. comprehensive and it really helps you understand the material in a more thorough way where your video absolutely does that. It, it breaks down the best and then it explains, you know, what you commonly see. And then it even gets into the ball motion and stuff with the Baker box. And so it's far more comprehensive and cumulative. And I guarantee you it's, you know, it's about a 40 minute, you know, 35, 40 minute video, each of these. And I guarantee you, if you were to watch 35 or 40 minutes of YouTube videos, you won't come, you won't come off of that with the same comprehensive understanding that you would I, did, I watched a lot of YouTube before I built it. And that's why I kept it to that number of minutes. I could have made them me on the cutting floor was another 15, 20 minutes of not sure it would have been any better, but I thought if I make this 60 minutes, people are not going to want to watch it. Right. So then right. now, of course, the most common email I get is why can't it be longer? I want more. Yeah. People are used to YouTube. So once they're done watching two minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes of whatever they like, no matter what you're watching in YouTube, there's constantly another here. If you like this, you'll like that. So there's just one right after the other. So some people I coach, when they watch YouTube, they watch three, four, five hours at a time. So they wanted my video to keep going. I'm like, well, after a while, it, you know, this thing wasn't free. It, it cost a lot of money to put this oh, thing God. together. So I get it. But yeah, it's it was a labor of love. I thought the two-handers deserved it. It's, it's uh, You could say it any way you want it. I think Jason Belmonte kind of saved our sport. Yeah. You know, oh. and Jason and I aren't, you know, we're not best friends. It's not like me and Chris. You know, yeah. Jason is is been was a pleasure to work with. I talked to him a couple times a month. He's nothing but professional. So I have nothing but a good thing to say about Jason. But he lifted the sport by himself. He yeah. put the sport on his shoulders because if the juniors, I know the guys at my age and they like to whine about everything. You know, you get older, you just you just complain that somebody even came. It's not that you're on my front yard. You actually looked at my front yard now. We've gotten so thin skinned as a country. So but Jason put the sport on his back. Yeah. Because juniors exploded. And when juniors yeah. exploded, our sport had a chance. So we came back from COVID, everything went crazy. And if, if I look at my ages 30 and under, the percentages that are bowling two-handed, it's fairly high. Yeah. So you have to give credit where credit's due. So I thought that that video needed to be made. And for one, I needed to get it out of my head. I see yeah. it. I think I could sell it. The Baker box is kind of cool. 
you know, obviously as somebody who's, you know, trying to make a buck, I thought it would blow up, but maybe it's going to be a a very consistent seller over two or three year period of time as people find out more about it. And I actually have to start doing some type of YouTube commercials to let other people know about it. I did one YouTube commercial with some guys and it really did help a lot. Yeah. So I'm going to step into that a little bit. Yeah. So that kind of gets into my, my question there. Do you feel like from doing a book to a DVD to YouTube, do you feel like getting information is it, you know, are we at a point where like you think we're the, the best point yet in terms of getting information? Cause we have so much of it and so much access or is it the opposite where it's almost too much information and now people can't really distinguish good information from bad information? Or do you even have an opinion on it? Well, I always have an opinion on everything. That's my problem. <laughs> I always I always step on my own. Uh, you know what? What's up, guys? Just a quick message to say that if you like bowling videos like this, make sure to hit that subscribe button. As always, we appreciate the support so much. We're growing quickly and we can't thank you enough. Now let's get back to the interview. Yeah. Because if anyone would know, it would be you. You know, you've made a book. Because it's on YouTube doesn't make it correct. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. all. I mean, so on the other on the flip of the flip of the coin, though, my numbers have never been better as a coach. More people are coaching. And I get, I mean, it's amazing how I hear this guy's going to start coaching over here in this state. We're going to take numbers away from you and we're going to kick Baker's ass. And, you know, one guy said, you know, Baker put the model, but I'm going to compete against him. Just bring it on, brother. I love it. I can fly coach. So I don't sweat it. I know whatever that that probably sounded bad, but I keep hearing all this stuff, how they're going to keep doing it over and over. So there's more coaching doesn't necessarily make it better. There's a lot of information. So what help is my in my business is because so much information is bad. I've never had this many lessons and they walk in broken. I've been watching YouTube. Their first line, I, I can't watch any more YouTube. I literally don't know how to walk now because right. as a coach, how I see it. And I understand that people on YouTube are trying to do the best they can. I'm not saying anything mean about them. Sure. But they're telling you what to do. I'm telling you what you can do after I've done it, you know, after I watch you bowl, to fast a few questions, understand. I mean, you got to know what's your bowling IQ, what's your bowling skill set, what's your athletic skill set, and how much time do you have to practice? Until you answer those four questions, I don't think you can coach anybody. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that's a great <clears throat> that's a great way to look at it, and that's the thing that I've always struggled with as a coach. Is you know, I can go to a USBC, you know, bronze, silver, whatever. I can go to a Kegel KCMP. And I can understand and memorize what you're supposed to do, what the best bowlers do. But the real art form, in my opinion, and the hardest part of coaching is figuring out how you get someone who's not doing anything close to that a little closer to it. You know, most people aren't close to that. I mean, I I have had the chance to work with the best bowlers in the world. And it's been it, it helped my name, you know, get out there as a coach. It is some of the best times I ever had coaching those guys. Because when you're coaching guys at that skill set and you tell Bill O'Neill to do one thing and then he takes about six shots and went, well, that makes sense. I like how that felt. Now leave me alone for the next three years. And then he just starts winning. I mean, I get credit for it. I I did maybe it identify it and say it a different way. But those dudes are really good. And that's about one tenth of one percent of what I do for a living. Right. Right. I mean, I coach just lady Chris just left. I've got her from 150. We're up to 185. She's coming to camp. In the last year, she's improved 35 pins. And she, now she said, I can't wait for my lesson. I have so much fun and I'm bowling better in league. And now I win brackets and I win occasional side pot. So you got to figure out why they're doing it. She right. just, she likes to win. So very rarely do I coach the pros. It's, it's not a business model that can, that can pay your bills. Right. So I coach just normal people on an every, you know, all day, every day. Yeah, so that's a great question. When you are trying to correct those that are not Bill O'Neill, you know, the customers you work with the most, what is what are your main go? You know, I see some coaches that like to do drills. Some coaches like to use, <laughs> you know, training tools. Some some coaches, you know, obviously you think they got different methods. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't argue with success, right? And you've really? been successful at it for a long time. So what is your main method for really creating improvement in players? Like, do you, is there a way that you not can- Not drills. Not drills. Okay, exactly. Yeah, this is a, the training center is a drill-free environment. Great. Yeah, that's that's the kind of info I'm looking for. So what do you, do you normally try to get them, you know, I notice like in your videos, you what I really like is you use a lot of like what I would call illustrative language, like swing set and conveyor belt and things that really help people kind of take a really technical thing and create a feel out of it. 
Mm -hmm. Do you find that that's your main strength, your main tool that you lean on is kind of the ability to use words and kind of create feel with that? I or communicate I, well. I, okay. I'm, I'm good. I, I work on that more, more than anything else as a coach. I work on, I know I have eight different vocabularies. Okay. So I, I put it into averages, 100 to 120, 120 to 140 to 160, 180, 195, 205, 210 to 215 and above. So I have eight different ways of talking to people because as a coach, I'm not the one throwing the ball. So, and I'm not the one paying. So my job as a coach, I would never ask you to do anything before I explain it. And the first thing I do is explain why you're not, first thing you have to find out what they want. And it's always the same two things. I want to be more consistent and want my scores to go up. So it's a little bit of lane play and it's how to throw the ball the same way twice. So I have a very specific method in how I do that. And so the first thing you have to, I mean, it's kind of the word trust, I guess, but more importantly, when people stand on the approach and they're looking at their target, if they aren't comfortable with what I'm asking you to do, they're not going to do it. So I'm pretty good at explaining, here's why you miss. Here's why you're not getting the result you want. Here's what we're going to do. And here's why we're going to do it. And then I have, you know, video in every shot because I'm very fortunate here. And then when they throw it and they can see that, you know, the remark that, it's, you know, it's a pretty good size difference in the first 20, 30 minutes. That's some of the stuff I'm doing, you know, timing and all that. So when they see the difference and the ball actually does what they want, then they'll pretty much do whatever I ask. But I'm pretty good at explaining why. I never say just do this because, you know, I was a good bowler once. You should do it because I say so. Right. I'm not, I wasn't a big believer in that in sports when I took lessons. <laughs> yeah. I really try to, the coaches that got through to me were you're, you're, you're 5'3", you're a freshman, you want to score a lot of points, you like to shoot but you're, you're too short to shoot the way you shoot the ball. Now you got to choose, you got to change the angle of your form and the angle of your trajectory because you're so short. I was five, three as a freshman. And the guy that taught me was the best player in history in my high school. So oh. he spent a half hour explaining trajectory and angle and my height. And he's six, six. And 30 minutes later, I just played an alumni, an alumni, but a b basketball game with my son, the fathers and the kids. And I made one little move. I got around, you know, we don't go backwards. We, we, we didn't have a three point line. We go forward. And even my son went, Dad, you just jumped up with a 15-foot jump shot, and your form was perfect. Coach Broom did that when I was 14 years old. I'm 63, so you pick the numbers. So I was taught the right thing, but it made sense then. And, I mean, I took one jump shot, and it makes sense now. So I've always tried to coach that way. If people aren't comfortable in their stance, they have absolutely no confidence in the delivery. And if you don't have confidence in, in being comfortable, you'll never be consistent. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that. I can't wait to get into a little bit more of that. That kind of leads me into what What do you feel like are the key elements that separate, you know, what I would say are really kind of four main skill levels. There's your 200 league average bowler, your 230 league average bowler, your kind of local tournament guy with like re maybe some regional titles and the national titles. Is there a way that you can you think about or identify maybe even someone's ceiling like based on those kind of skill levels? Because you, you talked about you kind of speak eight different languages kind of based yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I coach, you know, the way I look at it, I don't coach bowlers. I've never really coached bowlers. I coach successful people who bowl. I charge a lot of money. The people that I tend to see tend to be pretty squared away. So, and most of them aren't going to go on the tour. So, or none of them for that matter. You know, you some have aspirations and then I explain to them what it takes. And they all like, like my son, here's a good, here's a good way. Of, so first off, let's start from the top. So my okay. son Gage started to bowl pretty good a year ago, struggling a little bit in the summer. He's two-handed. He started to really grow. Now he's almost six one. So it's he's you know all arms and legs. And he wanted to get better. And I said, You don't practice enough. And when you do practice, you don't practice hard enough. Now you're 13. I get it. You got other things in life. Bowling isn't your job. Well, how hard do I have to practice? I went, You're tired of hearing it from me. Let's call Uncle Chris, which is you know. Big advantage I have when I say Uncle Chris, I'm calling Chris Barnes. Yeah. And Chris knows Gage, you know, since you know since he's been born. We call get you can call Chris, talk to him. I make Gage on the phone. Uncle Chris, how much do you practice? Now I don't practice as much, probably 50 games a week. Okay. When did you decide you were going to be a pro? When I got out of college, I didn't want to have a real job. So he's managed to pull that off for 30 years. He's never <laughs> had a real job. You got to give him points for that. Yeah. So 30 years. I, he goes, Well, how much did you practice? He goes, 100 games a week. And Gage went for how long? He goes, 100 games a week, and then gave him 30 years, Uncle Chris, you've been bowling 100 games a week. He went, that's it. So let's start there. 
Right. A guy with more God-given talent anybody ever coached was Chris Barnes. And then he decided to outwork everybody. Right. So if you want to be a tour player and win titles, start there. Yeah. Now, how many people, that sounds good, and a lot of people have lip service today. How many people are willing to do it? But the tricky part is you better be given a lot of God-given ability to start. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there, there's no, you can't say I'm just going to be a pro because I'm going to practice everybody. Well, a lot of it is, you know, I was a pretty good bowler because God touched me on the shoulder and said, you know, you're always going to be able to strike. And I never thought about it. I struck a lot, not as much as a lot of guys, but I did my career is you could do worse. Yeah. So if you're a player, <laughs> that's a tough one. Yeah. I, don't, I, you know, it's, it's such a hard, it's a hard job. Yeah. Very few make it. It's a very tough existence. Now with these rabbits, it's brutal. I yeah. feel so sorry for these rabbits today. We yeah. never had anything. Whatever yeah. they want to tell you from the 80s, we never had rabbits this hard. <laughs> never did I bowl for 10 spots. And I bowled rabbits for two years. Some yeah. weeks in St. Louis and Kansas City, 24 spots. Never 10. Right. So that's a tough way. So the tour player, you just better be the best bowler from your area. Now, when you say, sorry to interrupt you, when you say, you know, you do need some God-given talent, is that do you mean physically or do you yeah. mean kind of between the ears in terms of like a killer instinct or like, you know, I guess how much of that that it takes at that national level is a mental characteristic versus a physical one? If you've got the physical tools, when you get to the tour, it really is mental. Okay. It's really, so, you know, you, you how many times can you get knocked down and get up? Got it. So Because when, when EJ Tackett is running over the world right now, he's not really worried about your feelings. Exactly, yeah. Now, I had yeah. a maid. When I went on tour, it was easy. You had Mark Roth and Earl Anthony. You had killers. They were just right. killers. Yeah. And like Earl was like, we had a joke that, you know, I would come on tour and I'd go home. He goes, why are you going home now? I'm like, oh, come on. You just almost got it figured out. I'm like, I don't have anything figured out. You just need your bathroom remodeled. So you want me to stay on tour and take my money? And he goes, no, I got a big bathroom. Stay on tour longer. <laughs> well, I figured it out by the time I was 19, 20 that, you know, that that's a hard row. So I think once you get to that level, you better be really strong mentally because it's unforgiving. If you look at the tour, one guy's happy every week. And the rest of them are miserable. So it's hard. I mean, yeah. it, it's so the big thing I see, I just saw it a big post. If there was more money on tour, all these guys would have 10 titles. I think that's complete horseshit. Right. If you're that good, you'd go on tour. Yeah. I've seen the houses that some of these guys live in. Barnes lives in a nice house. If you yep. got that much game, never go on tour for money. Yep. Never, ever go on tour. So that's what's going to ruin college sports. So you saw what Saban said is how much money you're going to pay me. Not how much better as an athlete am I going to give? Are we going to win the title? How much am I getting paid? Yep. So if you're going on tour to make money, you should probably just get a real job, become whatever you want to become. There's all kinds of things to do in this world and become rich. Because yeah. bowling on tour, you're not, I mean, I would imagine Belmont, he's got a few bucks. Chris does. You can't name 20 guys that are retired from being a pro bowler that don't work. Yeah. That's hard to do. I totally agree. And, and I mean, it's not my expertise at all, but I would argue really anyone that has made a good deal of money really doing anything didn't start off with the goal of I'm going to make a lot of money. It was something more intrinsic. It was, you got to love it. Yeah. I, you know, and most of the really great competitors I've ever met, like I'm pretty close with Jacob and Jacob's a unique kid, but there's nothing he'd rather do than try and compete and win. Right. And he as, I mean, as kind of unique as Jacob is. He loves to compete. The best example is the guy who's won the most. I guarantee if Walter Ray's driving through Phoenix tonight and you have a five gamer somewhere, that dude's going to show up and try to win. Yeah, exactly. I've never seen a guy who likes to compete more than Walter A. Williams yeah. to this day. He'll yeah. bowl anywhere, anytime for any amount of money. So how do yeah. you, you can't put a, you can't put a, a X value on that. So the tour player is a very unique animal. You got to just, I went on tour for the right reason. I was very lucky. Barry Asher and Mike McGrath, I bowled league with. And they both told me, kid, you want to go on tour? Do not do it for money. You got to go on tour for one reason and one reason only. You've got to see how good you are against the best in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if that's what you want to find out, that's the place to find out. Because yeah. if you want to bowl Simonson and Tackett every week for a living and O'Neill and, and Belmonte and that crew, you better strap it on pretty tight. That's yeah. that's Those guys are beyond good. Yeah. They're scary good. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's so insane how much people don't realize how good they are. So that's how you think about the top level. I guess how do you – you talked about the different languages – how do you speak differently, coach differently with those other tiers of averages? Well, it just, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a tricky thing. The regional guy is a little easier. You know, I have, you know, it's just, I don't think that one's very hard. The rest of them are just trying to get them better. But like the regional player, you got, you know, I have, I have three or four guys that regionals that do really well. And they're, you know, it's, they all have good jobs. 
So it's a very tricky thing because practice has become very hard because the amount of centers we have left has been very impacted. So it's not, you know, Arizona seems to have a lot of bowling centers. You have a lot of bowlers in Phoenix. Whereas yeah. in Southern California, not only is it hard to get lanes, they're all far apart now. So traffic is a big problem. Mm. And then finding lanes that you can practice on that doesn't cost 60 bucks an hour, it's hard to get good at 60 bucks an hour practice. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's some trickiness going on to become, I think that's why you don't see as many regional players in Southern California as you once did. Because sure. of logistics of practice and cost of practice. Yeah, it's not the cost of the balls. I mean, if you're any good, you'll get a, it's not, you know, it's not the hardest thing in the world to get a ball contract, but it's, it's just hard to get the reps in. Yeah. You know, when I bowled, there was like two or three really big leagues that we all bowled and we practiced every day and then you bowled every week. And I was bowling six, seven days a week, you know, all the time before I went on tour. I think the, that's hard to do that, but talking to them is easy. You know, it's just, it's there. They got to get way more consistent. And the, and the part that they have to learn how to do is how to move around the lane way faster. Okay. You know, because the regionals break down, or as I say it, if you if you want to bowl regionals, you just have one job, end up with one more pin than PJ Haggerty every week in qualifying. And you'll be a really good bowler. That's my Got number it. one tip. Beat yeah. PJ by one pin every week and you'll be pretty good. Got it. So, and, and I mean, I know it can be frustrating with someone with your knowledge level. It can be frustrating when someone like me tries to boil everything down into a single word or single sentence, <laughs> good luck. but it, it sounds like the national tour level is a lot about resilience, the mental side, because the physical side is already there. The regional level, it sounds like the physical side obviously is still pertinent, but understanding the ball motion side and understanding how to get so, the right parts of the lane are key. The regional player needs to bowl has to, you've got to give it a commitment. You've got to give okay. it two years because you need to see two things. You first start bowling regionals and if Jacob's home, you know, the, the tour players are home and Darren Tang, and, you know, you got PJ and you got the guys that do really, really well. When you first bowl against them, you're like, these guys are great. Oh, my God, I'll never beat them. But if you bowl long enough and you bowl enough tournaments and that's fifth, sixth, seventh tournament, all of a sudden there'll be something out there to bowl on that you think is halfway easy. And then you'll see those guys not cash. If you just bowl one or two and they're on, you're just going, oh, my God, I was 50 under and they were 300 over in eight games. What am I doing? Right. But you have to bowl enough because then you'll start learning. So when they mean short we're going to all use urethane for 4.5 games. Then right in the middle of the fourth game, we all switch. Until you do that a few times, you don't know, okay, it's 37 to 39 feet. We stay with urethane for two games. Right. 41 feet. So yeah, Some guys try urethane. We're going to get here, and they're going to get up between fourth and fifth arrow. We're going to have something that's kind of big ball. It's not quite shiny, and you got to get this roll and stop. Right. Once you see how it all plays out over a year or two, you will see, like, I know it's game one, but I know in game three I'm here, game five I'm here in game seven, because they really do morph into a certain thing. And right. so you've got to have it where you're, you're going to get your brains, brains breed in. But then also on the flip side, you got to get it for that week where you bowl really good. You have a good run at it. You might finish in the top four where the guys that have been beating you don't. Then you go, oh, that's your moment. Oh, I can do this. So then it becomes really about experience and reps. You can't put in, and you got to have a really good spare game because of the sport shot. You got to have a good spare game. You can't, yeah, yeah. That, gets, that gets talked over too much. And people just assume but you got to be at 90, 95% of your makeables to both those guys. Right. And then the difference between, you know, the, that 190, 200 average league bowler and the 230 plus average league bowler, do you think that's just matchup, you know, or is there something more to that for, for those guys? I mean, the rev rate, I mean, the rev rate's a real rev thing. Rate. Some of the guys that average 230 have a pretty good hand. A lot of it's, you know, anywhere in Southern California could be where you bowl. Some centers are much easier than others. Sure. Uh, but I think the guys that average 230 just repeat way more. They're way more, you know, they repeat or they got a really good thing. Or you get a, you've got a group of guys now that are really good at bowling balls. They've right. got a very specific, I use this ball for game one. I make this move for game two, then game three. They have a very, you know, it's a very unique thing. I didn't do that. I'm not wired to do that. I can right. coach it. I don't, I wouldn't do it as a bowler. The last seven, eight years I bowl league, I just made it easy. I had one ball. I had, an, I had, an, had a magic touch by Evan Knight. And I was high average in Orange County for seven years. So I was all right. But I, you know, I have a different skill set. And I bowled at one center on the high end, and I could get away with one ball. Right. But right. now the the guys that do that pretty well, the average two thirty, they're 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 still people tend to downplay. I see. I mean, all the videos, everything on YouTube and all the social media, it all talks about three things: release, drills, and rev rate. And I don't really work on any of those. Yeah, yeah. And and release and rev rate, 
you could maybe argue are almost the same thing. I mean, are, they're, they're kind of close. I mean, I no, would, consistency of release and rev rate have nothing to do with each other. Uh, oh, consistency of release. Right, but, right. Yeah. But they're just talking about how you have to have EJ. It just happened last week. A guy came in, you know, as a bowler. What do you average? I average 80. So in my mind, you average 180. No, he meant 80. So oh. like, right, what do you want to work on? I got to get the pro release. I've got to have the yo-yo. I've got to be able to collapse my wrist. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> you know, that's never – I'll explain to you how I see that in a second. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's not how I coach, but we'll give it a run. So he goes, gutter, 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 gutter. Wow. I'm like, when you said you average 80, did you actually mean 080? Yeah, 80. I'm <laughs> like, I mean – so basically you can't do math. Like, you don't know how to do 2 plus 2, but you want to be a third-year student at MIT doing string math. Exactly. You may have this in the back. You may have this backwards. So yeah. what do you mean? I said, here's how this works. Here's how I coach. Every bowler I see is a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. How do you do jigsaw puzzles? The average thing on YouTube and all this talking about release. Because I watch some of them. Some are amazing. Some people's rev rates are so high, they average zero by the dots. <laughs> Their ball just goes in the gutter as soon as it comes. Because they're so loaded. I mean, the guys from Japan are cool, man. They load it up and they buy the little tricky spinnies on the ball. And they're spinning their hand and they're collapsing it down. It's like the guy down the driving range that can hit it 330, but he can't keep it on the driving range. Right. You got a good exactly. release. You can't bowl a lick. I'm a score guy because I paid my bills. Wells Fargo never asked me what my rev rate was. Can you <laughs> knock down pins? I knocked down a lot of pins. You must have a good rev rate. Wells Fargo, my mortgage, never asked which my rev rate was first. You got my money? I got your money. You yeah. must be okay. Yeah, exactly. How do I coach? They're doing a jigsaw puzzle opposite of how I do a jigsaw puzzle. How do you do a jigsaw puzzle? I mean, one piece at a time, I guess. I don't know how to answer that. Yeah, that's just what they're doing. So they're taking the release and the rev rate. What, where's that piece go? Right in the middle. Oh. A jigsaw puzzle from the middle. I do it from the four borders. I Top like is consistency. Cool. Bottom is timing. Side is balance. The other side is accuracy. I build those four things solid. Got that it. picture of you bowling. In my yeah. mind, when you're done, there's a picture of you, and we just cut it up into a jigsaw puzzle, and I got to put the pieces together. If sure. I start with those four borders, and I make them good, and I build in from there, when you do a jigsaw puzzle and the last piece is how hard is the last piece to put in? It's not. Not very just hard. just lay it down there and it always fits. That's yeah. how I cook. That, I, 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 love, I love that metaphor. That's 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 great. Because <laughs> you don't have balance. You don't have timing. You can't be a good bowler. Right, right. Because so, accuracy has been not. It's just been thrown away. Tackett is cool looking on TV, and nobody likes watching Tackett bowl more than I do. Yeah, I think he's yeah. he broke up my Mount Rushmore. My four best releases of all time were Don Johnson, Marshall Homan, I'm Leto Monticelli and Tommy Jones. Those were the four guys that – the only four guys I wish I had their release. Right. I had a pretty good release, but those four guys were here. I think EJ's there. Yeah. So it's Mount Rushmore and a dude on top. That's yeah. how good I think he is. So I watch him all the time. Of course I would, but there's only one guy in the world with EJ Tackett's release. You think the guys on tour aren't trying to watch him? You think they like getting beat in by him every week? They're not trying to emulate him? So if the guys on tour with the most skill set can't do EJ Tackett, some dude that walks in as a CPA that bowls three games a week, probably not going to do EJ Tackett. Yeah, exactly. Well, I have to have a nicer way of saying that. Yeah. And I try. Right. Sometimes I'm in a good mood. Sometimes I'm not. But that's how I see it. So if I can build those borders, all of a sudden when they say, I've never had my release this consistent. I've never hit my target this much. I can't believe how many four baggers I'm throwing. And I said nothing about the release. If I get everything in the right position, I will put your hand in the correct position. Then it's a matter of God-given talent. Can you make it do that or not? Yeah, you can teach yeah. it all you want. That's why that I'm not a big believer in the drills because they're teaching you to feel it off your hand. But if you throw the ball really good, you feel it out of your legs, and your oh, hand okay. just re your hand just reacts to your legs. Sure, sure. So then, if I were to sum up, I think what you're saying really is the release is kind of on the right hand side of the equal sign, so to speak. It's more of a result. Way on the right hand side. Yeah, it's more of a result of you know, balance and accuracy and, and these, you know, these other things that are more like the, the foundation. And so when you have someone come in. Um, if your ball isn't at the right place at 45 feet, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant what your release looks like. If you're an EJ's cool because at 45 feet, his ball's in the same place every week. Getting yeah. ready to hit the pocket. That's where his right. ball is. Right. So right, right, right. the dude hits the pocket a lot. He's like, well, you know, like Roth was. He had the guy with the most power that's halfway accurate. But, you know, the, so the what's the strength of EJ Tackett? What is his number one strength that nobody talks about? I mean, versatility. you see it every week and nobody talks about it. Versatility? I don't know. I don't know. Consistency of rev rate. Okay. It's not how big your rev rate is. Right. It's how tight the back two numbers are. 
right, right. The right, spread right. is more important than the front number. But right. everybody's enamored with the front number. Yeah. So when you watch Tackett, he's on the last show, 5'10", 5'10", 5'10", 5'10", 5'10". Because his spread is so tight on the back, he magnifies the – so now the five in the front is, holy shit, this guy has a 500 rev rate that's the most consistent. That's why he's so good. Yeah, yeah. Because what do um, people do? They tend to have a rev rate around, let's say, 375. And they're hitting the pocket, and they're the pocket. Then they have a 350. Then they have a four and a quarter. So everybody gets those two wrong, by the way. You realize that, right? Right. When your rev rate goes up, your ball doesn't hook more. But right. it doesn't. I got right. specto. I watch it every day. Yeah. You know, your ball gets high rev rate. It tends to go longer. Right. It doesn't go Brooklyn. The shot that the rev rate goes down, that cuts and goes Brooklyn. Right, right. Everybody gets, oh, my rev rate went down. My ball's not going to hook. <laughs> That's not true. Right. Anyways, but his rev rate is so consistent and he's accurate. So then he's by far the most fun to watch as who's one handed. Right. O'Neill, same way. Then you got the two hander. Simonson's just, you know, they're, they're so good, but it's consistency of rev rate, not right. just a number, but it has to be a number with accuracy. That's how right. I look at it. So, no, I think that's great. So, my, my, another question I had for you was, you know, I'm sure you have some lessons. Obviously, again, having the amount of reps you have that I mentioned before and just the amount of background, the percentage of lessons like that I might have where I feel like maybe this person didn't improve is probably a higher number than what you have, again, because you're just a much more skilled coach. So, my question to you is, what do you think differentiates between the people who really leave lessons improved versus not improved? You're is serious it, with that question, right? Yeah. Yeah. I like to eat and I like to pay my bills. If they don't get better every lesson, I don't have a job. I don't okay. have those. Issues. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, obviously the coach could be one. I mean, I feel like I have some lessons where, you know, I just didn't see any improvement and I, and I immediately really? put it on myself as a coach. And so that's, so I, that, that's where it should go. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I take that personal. Yeah. They have to good. leave here with something they figured out before they walked in the door. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of times what I'm doing now because of the because of how bowling works, because it's so hard to get a lanes expensive. A lot of what I do now is this is going to sound probably crazy is a lot of what I do now is maintaining them. I have people that I see once a month that don't practice because they their jobs don't allow them to get to the lanes when they're when they want to practice. And on the weekends, you know, there's 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 a lot of boleros. So they don't want to go when the lights are out and the birthday parties are jumping and the, and the music's. Just, you know, going, I mean, they're, they're making a living as a, as a company, but it doesn't, for a guy who wants to work on his game or a girl who wants to work on their game, that's not conducive to that. So right. a lot of times they come to me once a month. And so I, I maintain them. I get them to a, they get to the number they really like, Hey, I'm shooting 600 every week. This is so much fun. I don't ever shoot under 550. I'm really happy. Let's make it. Then they're, you know, they're, they're shooting 600 almost every week there. That's the, that seems to be a big number. I got to break 500 on a consistent basis. If I can shoot over six, then you get to the 650 or betters. I don't have too many guys that people that average 230 don't take lessons, by the way. So I don't really sweat that guy. Sure. 230 bowlers just very rare. I'd say one look this week, none. Well, I'd say one a week, one a month. Take at right. 230. They tend not. To, they tend not to be my 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 people that I take lessons with. So I don't sweat that one too much. They're pretty good. 230. There's a there's a finite number on the game. 300. So if you're 230. I'm not sure. I can make you average 230 easier, but I, I can't say you come to me. I'll take you from 230 to 240. Yeah. The easiest way to do that is like, well, go bowl at Camarillo or go bowl at Winnetka. I can tell you the bowling centers have the best carry. You want to raise your average? I'll just tell which bowling center to bowl at. That's what I've always. That's what I've always loved about you. You're just so honest and transparent, and I, I appreciate that. I also, you know, because you have really been coaching for the entire evolution of two-handed. I love that you mentioned you felt like Belmo really kind of brought the sport back from the grave, so to speak. And from a pro shop standpoint, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the amount of people that we see really get into bowling very fast because they can hook it at a, at a very, you know, sooner point in their bowling career is, I mean, the amount of people that we see with a three ball roller with a polyester ball and two performance balls that have never bowled a league and have only been bowling for a year is just, you know, years ago that the only time you saw a three ball roller come, they bowled league and they've been bowling for years, you know, uh, That's twenty percent of my business now. People that don't believe. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. And they're they're so, two-handed, and they and they can't get enough. They love. Yeah, in, you know why they the, don't believe uh, right here? You know why they don't believe? It's I don't not tell enough me. games. It's not enough games. Wow, interesting. Interesting. So I have a, a large. I have a large Vietnamese contingent. They all bowl fountain. I got at least five guys I coach, and they bowl together, and they keep their 
smart dudes, they keep their own spreadsheets. So like, wow. no, we vote 10 games. Three games is not – and people and people vote too slow. Yeah. We are, we're here to bowl. Ten games and we bowl 10 games in two hours. Yeah, I've definitely heard too slow. And then, you know, when I did one of these with Blanchard, we were joking that – some people don't even stay married for as long as winter league is, you know, the, uh, <laughs> that's a good line. The commitment. I steal that, one. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. The commitment level too is also, there high. You go. So I like that on the, uh, on the two handed side, there was something in your video that I thought was really great. And that was that for the two handers, it's like, Hey, let's talk about, you know, your accuracy and, you know, consistency balance, those kinds of things, it, because your release is already good. And I was thinking about that dynamic. And would you say then that if you're going with a traditional thumb in, does that mean that, in, you know, you probably have to work on the release a lot because clearing that thumb is body balance is way more important. Got it. Yeah. You've got to get them in really good balance. I mean, how I say it all the time is if I can control your head, if you can control your head, you can control your hand because where your head goes depends what your thumb does. Because, you know, your chin's hooked onto your shoulder socket, your shoulder socket determines your thumb. So that's why the best bowlers all have their chins on their kneecaps. Their hands can stay behind it. Once your head goes in front of your kneecap, you suck that right shoulder in if you're right-handed. Once the right shoulder rolls in, you can't keep your thumb back, and your hand rolls right. on top of the ball. So Got I spend it. a ton of time on that. Two-handers tend to have super early timing when they get to me. That's why the video is so important. Like my yeah. favorite bowler is Jason Belmonte. Then why do you collapse in your second step? I got to get low. See that there? That You just got told the wrong thing. The best right. bowler of all time, two-handed, has minimal knee bend. So right. I can show here's Jason. On my laptop, here's you. Oh, yeah, your second step, you've dropped the ball basically three feet down and your arms never moved. That's not a swing. That's what you said. I came up with the new terms. That's a, that's the elevator shaft. Your arms yeah. dropped three feet. The ball never moved. You got to pick it up, pull it down, and you throw it with your shoulder, and the ball goes both ways. So, yeah, the two handed thing is I have, I can't, the amount of people that walk in with three ball roller, perfect example spare ball, medium ball, high end ball. Where do you bowl league? I don't bowl league. How often do you bowl? Five days a week. They can't get enough. <laughs> I and love they're it. Two -handed. They tend to have very, very early timing. I fix their timing. All of a sudden now they're, I fix their, they tend to drift right with early timing. Like you're not really watching your favorite bowler very much because that boy yeah. don't drift right. They all drift, <laughs> little, some drift way more left than others. Yeah. Exactly. Gonna, you know, in the video, I explain all that. So, and then I get them just to do a few things different. And next thing you know, six bagger and they're snapping that 10. Like I was pretty good in my day. I don't know. My ball did that. I'm like, because I get asked every day, if you could have been a kid again, what would you do? I said, oh, if I was 17 with my athletic skills, how intense I was, you may never heard of Jesper. I'd have been at 650 rev rate. I was 6'3", 210, and I was intense. Yeah. So I, that was my rev rate would have got to 700 just to say I did it. Yeah, that was, was a question. Crazy. That was a question I was going to have for you around two-handed is if you have a, a youth player now and you don't know anything else, do you do you encourage him into two-handed versus traditional one-handed? I know you probably wanted to know what he was going to say. I know I wanted to know as well. You're going to have to check out the rest of our interview. Another 40 minutes of interview and great answers and insight from Mark Baker. Next week, part two of this interview. As always, thanks so much for your support. Like, comment, subscribe. Make sure you let us know down in the comments who would you like to see us interview in the future. We look forward to seeing you guys next week for part two with Mark Baker.